Hello, everyone. You're listening to Digital Builder, a podcast brought to you by Autodesk, made for construction professionals who want to hear from those on the forefront of construction technology. If you're looking for conversations centered around where the industry is going, this podcast is for you. Each episode will feature a conversation with a construction industry leader. Together, we'll dig in on themes related to connected construction and discuss where the future of the construction industry is headed. Now let's get started. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 28 of Autodesk's Digital Builder podcast. I'm your host, Eric Thomas. This week, we're discussing how to manage uncertainty during challenging economic conditions within the construction industry. And I know there's a lot of stuff happening in the world, and over the last two years with the pandemic and a whole lot of other uncertainty we're managing, this is a really topical moment for our organizations to kind of step back and go, what have we learned in the last couple of years, and how can we improve our relationships with our our customers to in turn improve and you know manage that uncertainty in a more intentional way. So to help tell the story and share some of the lessons that they've learned working with their clients in the last few years, I'm joined by two leaders from CRB. We've got Greg Casper, the Director of Estimating, and Mark Hansen, the Senior Director of Construction Operations from the Midwest region. Gents, thanks so much for joining me on the show today. I am really excited to have you on and learn a bit more about what you've been working on in the last couple of years. Thanks, sir. You know, Greg and I are, are pretty passionate about this topic in particular. We we share a lot of ideas about it. I'll be up at two in the morning and I'll send him a, a escalation article or something and and then we'll we'll chat about it and how we we got to do it. So happy to be on today. Yeah, really happy to be here, Eric. Thanks for having us. Yeah, I, I can tell I've got a couple of construction nerds here because I, I do the same thing as far as opining at strange hours about whatever particular construction tech is, uh, you know, capturing my tension of that day. So I think we've got a we got a good crowd here to, to kind of dig into the weeds and, you know, share some lessons learned. And as I mentioned ago, that uncertainty has is, is definitely been a challenge, not just within construction, but across the world as we've navigated so many unexpected and strange change conditions. And when I first met both of you, you, you shared thoughts about the, the position that you serve as construction managers and how you impact the way we work within the construction industry. So at a high level, I'd love it if you could both explain the role that a CM plays and share some of that perspective for the start of this conversation. And Mark, could you kick that off for us? Yeah, I mean, as as construction managers, we're really focused on bringing risk risk management to the forefront of what we're trying to do for our clients. When you look at a typical general contractor, they're doing a lot of self-perform work. I mean, that takes a tremendous amount of effort just in itself, a lot of discipline. You're focused on a lot of downstream activities. I think construction management allows us to focus more upstream. It, it allows us to hire people who are experts at their field to do what they're going to do, bring teams together, and really focus on the team team dynamics more than it's, it's not necessarily about making money. I mean, it is, we're, we're trying to run a business here, but at the, at the end of the day, it's about the teaming, the repeat business with our customers and, and managing, managing risk because there's a lot of it in our industry. Yeah, I'd add, I'd add on to that, Eric, that you know, partnered with our, our design business, we're able to come to the table very, very early in projects and bring that full breadth expertise to help you know, see what, what hurdles are out there and, and and plan and navigate around them. Now, I mean, there's been a lot of surprises over the last couple of years, don't get me wrong, but I think that ability to engage with the thought leaders in our design business and then also on our owner's side early really helps us steer the projects towards success. And I think that all does come back to relationships. And it's something that I've spoken about a lot on this show is in construction relationships, I think are, are more important than almost any other business that I can think of due to the, the nature of the work that we're doing and the impact that each temp team member actually does have. And I, I'm hearing more and more often of the value of starting those conversations earlier and bringing the right people in earlier because it allows you to have that impact that you're talking about. So that's encouraging to hear. And I, I appreciate the the perspective on, on CMs in general. And We've talked about it a little bit as far as uncertain market conditions and what's changed in the last couple of years. I'm interested, where where is your team specifically anticipating some of those biggest areas of risk in the coming year? So I'll start with that one, Eric. I mean, obviously, the volatility of commodities over the last couple of years has been on everyone's mind. The, the ripple effects of the pandemic across the supply chains, 
Like we had a uncharacteristic weather event shutting down critical manufacturing in Texas last year. And now we're talking about the war in Ukraine rattling certain markets, maybe such as stainless steel via, via nickel. These are spoken about often. But you combine that with maybe some times and locations in the last year or so where volume was down, trade contractors having to take on work, maybe cutting their margins a bit, taking on a bit more risk. We're worried about default on projects and, and we have robust pre-qualification processes to help cover that. But again, I, I think that's fairly common knowledge right now. I, I go to a topic that was talked a lot about before the pandemic, but has been relatively quiet since then, and that's labor. Volume dropped off and labor was no longer an issue, but now as projects come back and the volume of work that's out there starts to increase back up to where it was before, we're starting to see some issues with efficiency and just being able to staff projects. Yeah, I, that one resonates with me. I, I was at the Kirk conference in Florida last year and they, they talked about the average workforce by 2030 is gonna be 47 years of age. Our workforce is becoming far less mobile. People like working from home. And so we're gonna be battling that, which is, is certainly gonna shrink our workforce al already. Um, a lot of people are choosing technical related schools. They wanna go get a programming degree versus a, a construction degree or, or go work in the trades. And so that's certainly a trend. Globalization versus nationalism, right? I mean, what everyone's kind of bringing, you, you see it with Intel. I'm in Arizona right now and there's a million cranes up in the air. I think there's 20 or $100 billion worth of work coming here. And that soaks up all the craft labor. On the life sciences side of it, new drugs are being developed at such rapid rates and new food technologies are being developed at such rapid rates that everyone's wanting to invest in that. And so we're going to grow at, at, you know, 20, 30 X a year in the construction industry, but our labor force is not scheduled to do that. So how do you, how do you shift your business to do that? And it, a lot of it points towards getting more productive, whether it's, you know, prefabrication or some of the things that we're probably going to talk about later in the podcast. Yeah, you you both make such an interesting point. And even just coming back to the the managing uncertainty element, I think in, in Greg, you mentioned weather for a moment, which obviously is not tied to the pandemic whatsoever. And I think that's an important thing to to note because the construction industry has managed to navigate the uncertainty since the the inception of building things. And I think that's why we were so well dispositioned to really quickly adapt and navigate these changes and implement adjustments that are going to impact the way our businesses function for, for forever. And, and Mark, a lot of the stuff that you've just shared, I am so interested to see where it goes as far as the balance with remote work within the construction industry and, and improving the perception to bring new people in as our, our, our tradespeople and, and senior staff start to get a little bit closer to the retirement age. I personally think that the the remote work focus is an opportunity for our industry, but it really ties into how we we implement it because especially as we're constrained with resourcing, if there's a technical job or a data-focused job, and there's more and more of those every day as we adopt more technology, and that person doesn't have to be on site, but we can tap people who live in Iowa working on a project in Florida. Like there's a lot of cool stuff and it's just a matter of figuring out how the heck we manage it. And we've kind of been flying by the seat of our pants for a long time, but I think we're getting closer to the mark. And I'm for one, just excited to see how all of this stuff continues to unify. It's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. I will say we we're seeing a lot more interest from our clients right now. We're seeing a lot more interest at, at different conferences we attend. So there's a lot more attention on lean methodology and, and maybe four years ago, if you ask a subcontractor, if they have lean experience or if they, they've done last plan or the answer was no, but now it's becoming, well, yes not much or, or yes, I'm, I love it. I'd never want to go away from it. So I think that's encouraging on trends. Yeah. And that rapid technology adoption that we've experienced has, I think, accelerated our ability to have those conversations in a meaningful way. Like our feet were held to the fire for the last two years because we had to pivot. We had to digitize more quickly. And it was tough in the moment for some organizations. But I think the net outcome is is really important. But I, I want to come back to the uncertainty conversation. So I appreciate you 
sharing some of those risks that you're you're envisioning for yourselves and the customers that you support. But if we do look back for where your team has been, where have you been able to to manage that uncertainty and, and adjust your approach on the fly and you know stay on track with budgets and schedules? Like what were some of those elements where you had a lever to pull where you know some of the gaps that you saw where you go, well we can't change this, but we need to adapt. I, I'd love to little to get a little bit more of a glimpse into you know some of those pivots that your team made and, and where those success stories were yeah and i this is where i think greg and i could go on for a while but you know first and foremost you need a client who understands what we're trying to navigate here and can be very nimble if you look at typical you know large organizations that we work for they have a procurement group for a reason because they're trying to buy the best value for their company but that also comes with a lot of approvals and workflows that that hold up quick responses. So where we found a huge success is getting buy-in from our clients who understand the market right now. We bring that transparency to them and, and kind of bring a, a plan early on how we want to buy out in a fashion that is both transparent and, and value add to them. And so that's kind of the first aspect of it. But being able to buy early, right? Everyone's like, well, the commodities are going to come down. And that's that's not been the case at all. I think with you know lumber, we, we don't buy much lumber, but Lumber has come down since pandemic peak. Haven't looked at it in the last month or two, but but I did see it coming down. So there was one one example of buying early we had, and it's it's a project that's ongoing right now. We had ten miles of twenty four to forty inch, forty eight inch HDP piping. Typically, we'd rely on our subcontractor to buy that, but we we knew the size early in design. The client was willing to sign off on the fact, hey, we're going to go buy this now and and eliminate a lot of this risk because. Project team was giving me a presentation. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's a lot of pipe. We better we better get this on site before we commit <laughs> to anything on paper. And the client was like, hey, let's go buy this. We got it on site. It's already on order. We haven't even finished. I mean, we're nowhere close to finishing design and, and this pipe is already procured. So I, I think entering the work stream much earlier, making early design commitments. So if we can get our owners to say, well, we're, you know, we're we're going back and forth between a four four inch line and an eight inch line, but we know the eight inch line is is a little more expensive. If we can get some of those commitments early, yeah, we're gonna spend a little bit more money intentionally, but we may save it on the backside because we didn't do a ton of extra design or uh, procurement efforts or, or the materials got escalated. And uh, yeah, Greg, I'll let you comment on that if you have anything. Yeah, maybe another example, Eric, I can recall a key project for us out West early last year. And I was preparing the, the estimate and design review meeting for the structural steel package. And this is a very tight project, but nothing on that, you know, from that estimate review was on the critical path. So it was a, you know, it was a traditional estimate review we were prepping for. Got an email from another colleague on the other side of the country early that morning, notifying us of coil steel going on allocation and what that did to lead times for things such as roof decking immediately quickly looked at the schedule and that blew our schedule completely out of the water. But what we're able to do, you know, that our client at the time likely would not have been able to react in time to was we had an order out for that roof decking that same week and we were able to still maintain that schedule. So you ask about different levers to pull when, you know, you follow the, the McLeamy curve and you actually have more you, we all know this, you have more opportunity to course correct in greater magnitudes earlier on a project. And, and that was just one example of that, where, where our involvement early on really saved a schedule for a project whose product is life altering for those patients. And I think that's where we get a lot of our motivation from too, is the end result of our products are typically therapies that are very important to someone, some patient on the other end or some consumer of a, a food and beverage product, I mean, who can't identify with that, right? It's such an important element of the construction industry at large, I think. And and I love how passionate people are, especially tied to some of the things you've just shared. And even teams that aren't necessarily building life sciences or healthcare focused facilities, there's there's such a great sentiment tied to like we built that like we were out there we've we've done that and it's it's a tangible thing that that impacts people's lives for so many years and so i i love the the glimpse that you both have have tried to share in 
trying to find some of those levers to to pull to to offer opportunities to course correct when surprises come in and as i mentioned a minute ago i, I think construction obviously has been well dispositioned to a degree to do this for a very long time and we're now at a point where since that uncertainty just kind of continues to prevail we're, we're getting better at it in ways that even when things settle down again I think the way we work as is, is a is an industry is actually going to be heavily impacted for the positive. As I kind of think back to everything you've shared so far, I feel like we're we're kind of wrapping up in in three buckets. And, and correct me if I'm off base here, but it feels like like the delivery methods that we're adopting as we work with customers, especially for net new projects, feels like a key lever that we can focus on. The relationships that everybody has in the project are incredibly important, especially if the uncertainty steps possibly out outside of the realm of the construction contracting you've done already. I think an understanding client goes a long way in being able to take a look at the world and not just, you know, put your nose to the grindstone and say, but you signed up on the dotted line, so here you go. And there's obviously going to be a degree of that anyway. We're all not just out here building for fun. And then the other element sounds like the that early focus on the, the materials and the costs and especially as we have moved away from that moment, as you indicated a minute ago, Greg, of the costs will go down. It's like, well, they might not. Being able to find ways to identify those early and buying up what you can and, and kind of building from there. Does that seem like a good synopsis of those those levers that you're looking at right now? Yeah, I would say I would say that's right, Eric. And I, I, I would say there's probably like 100, a million other levers we could pull, right? But those are, those are broad categories. And, and uh, Greg and I did do an article just specifically on that, that kind of went into more detail than we probably could go through in an hour. Happy to share that link with you after this. Yeah. For our listeners, we'll include that in the show notes if you want to take a look at, uh, That'd be great. Yeah. at a little bit more of that detail. And so with those three buckets in mind, I think let's let's take a look at d delivery methods here now. Can you talk about some of the challenges that you have experienced with some of the more traditional delivery methods that we're all familiar with and adapting to those challenges as this uncertainty is is kind of just continued. We'll just we'll we'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, I'd say I mean we know most of the audience knows that that traditional delivery methods contracting models Ultimately, it's about risk and where you put them. And, and unfortunately, some of those models really force parties up and down the chain of commitments to protect their risk. And who wouldn't want to in this market? What we're finding success in is, is optimizing the outcomes by developing the right team, owner included, around a shared risk reward model. Not everybody's wired this way, so it does take some education ultimately changing the dynamics of that team interaction for, you know, protecting risk from protecting risk towards driving towards that shared goal. And uh, I think we'll hit on this a bit further, but we call that delivery model here at CRB our, our one solution model. I was at, again, the same Kirk conference I mentioned earlier uh, last year in Florida. CII was was partnering with Kirk for that specific conference and they they just released a report. So they've, they've come up with a way to analyze any given project based on cost metrics, schedule metrics, quality metrics, safety metrics. And they put values on those about how, how the projects ended up. And then they, they looked at, I think, 100, 100 plus projects, large capital projects in different business sectors across design, bid, build, design, build, IPD. And it's a, it's, it's a model that they plan to use moving forward. Any project can be measured against this. And by and large, all the data is very clear that the traditional method is the worst way, design, bid, build. And the best method by far was IPD and, and almost every every metric you could you could qualify. So I think I think it by educating folks on on that and and getting them to try something new, maybe we could get more productive. Maybe we could solve these problems that we're we're facing and we've talked about so far. I want to take a look at that research that you're sharing because it sounds it's putting data against something that we've all talked about, I think, for a long time, but didn't have necessarily the, the proof point to bring people along into that conversation that we're, we're reluctant to do so. And Greg, as you were kind of talking about 
like the risk sharing in construction, as we know, it's there, there's a litigious element on occasion, and people definitely need to protect themselves if it is an organization, and that's fair. That makes sense. Like we, we're all, you know, we're all doing work. We're all businesses. I think things like IPD and more flexible me methods, like uh, you're alluding to, start to share that risk in a little bit more of a honest way and in a fair one, in a way that does let you start being more productive because that incentive pivot from I, I need to protect my data, I need to protect my things to make sure that I'm okay. Now it shifts and in your you're talking as a as a we, as a one single entity. And so when one person wins, everybody wins. And I love to hear that everything that came out of Kurt. So I'm going to be chasing you for that article or any information <laughs> you could share afterwards because to help lead people into that conversation and empower them to feel comfortable taking that on, I think will have a big impact for, for our, our industry at large. And for those out there who are interested in contracting specifically, you should listen back to an episode we did with Carolyn Cromines, who talked about contracts and understanding risk and understanding what you're signing up for. I think all of these things do play a part in, in kind of moving the industry forward in a really meaningful way. And I, I think the last two years have just kind of accelerated that a little bit. Mark, I know we were we were talking about IPD here and not everybody on the on the on the line might actually know what we're talking about in any detail. Could you go a little bit deeper and just give a little bit more context on on what integrated project delivery and some of the adjacent models really really bring to the table versus some of the more traditional ones? Yeah. So integrated project delivery is really about bringing all of the people in, involved in the value stream on a project together as early as possible on a project with the idea that they're going to share in some sort of risk and reward. It's it's a shared set of ideals. I think more than anything, it's about teaming, sharing information. In many of our cases, we bring in trade partners very early. We have them sitting with our owners, potentially our end user of our facility, our design and construction folks. And we're all talking about the design. Are there better ways to do this? Hey, this is, this is a cheaper electrical component. Maybe you should choose this. And just having really open collaborative discussions on every topic and then a, and then a shared ideals about hey we're this is our target cost having that open transparency a lot of owners are scared to share their total project cost with their subcontractors i don't i don't know why but it, that happens a lot it's like all right if we just everyone opens their book and we say hey we're this is a very risky business and, and we we take that step together then then ideally you're gonna and now statistically you're gonna end up in a much better place on cost and schedule, quality and safety. So at, at CRB, we've taken that one step further. So we, uh, Greg mentioned it, one solution. I'm going to plug this a little bit, but it's really everything IPD about integrated projects. But we've set up, there's 24 different metrics that we kind of judge ourselves against. And there are certainly shades of, of what we call one solution, which is how do we get more integrated? How do we have better team health? How do we work in ways that are more transparent and collaborative with the idea that we're going to have better performance and we keep talking about Nirvana, right? So IPD is on the left-hand side of the screen. Nirvana is the right. We're probably never going to reach Nirvana, but we can try. And then we can we can grade ourselves against those 24 criteria. And I, I think what you're talking about as far as the risk sharing goes, like with owners being reluctant to, to kind of open the door a little bit, when you formalize and, and really do adopt the, the different models and methods and have those honest conversations at the beginning, I think it makes it a little more obvious that, okay, I feel like I'm potentially putting myself at risk as you know the owner by sharing these, but also everybody else has a t seat at the table and is doing the same thing. And so it's, it's a common goal and not a, a one-sided sharing thing that you know changes that conversation. And I, I think we're getting closer there. So it sounds like your team is taking IPD and, and just amplifying the, uh, the goodness there, and especially as you continue to bring on partners for, you know, repeat projects, that process probably gets easier to accelerate every single time because people know what to expect then because it was successful the last time. Yeah. And I'd say we can't, we can't do that in a vacuum though. We can't say, Hey, we're going to operate in this fashion if we don't have a buy-in from our, our trade partners or our own owner, because the owner may come back and say, Hey, this is design bid build. You got to do it this way. And we're going to say, okay. Yep. Well, we're not going to get these benefits, but let's go. 
it's and that's fair, you know, and, and not every project will benefit from that and not every, every right. circumstance necessarily. But I think when we find those opportunities where it does make sense and being very intentional about how we share the idea and, and help educate the industry at large on, on the benefits of this, especially now that there's data. I'm a data nerd, so I can't wait to, to take a look at some of this. I think we're we're incentivized to, to kind of move that conversation along in a in a pretty cool way. But looking at the next pillar now, so we were we were thinking materials and cost, and you've both shared a couple examples of, of where you were able to make some impacts already. And I'd like to try to go a little bit deeper in how you've actually gone out and pulled that lever. And Greg, you sounded passionate about this one, so I'm going to put you in the hot seat first and foremost. Can you give us a little bit more context on how CRBs adapted and managed some of these unexpected cost and material shortages or price increases in the last couple of years? Where are you really finding where you've been able to make impacts? Yeah, Eric, I think I'd like to speak first towards maybe traditional delivery models that we still engage in. We do our best to be as explicit as possible about the validity of pricing and the risks that we foresee. Going as far as suggesting owners contingency to cover potential escalation, attempting to negotiate fair contracts or rules of engagement around anchors back to published indices for for change in the future as a way to maybe tamp down on some contingency needs early on in projects. But I don't think that gets us all the way there toward you know approaching that nirvana state that that Mark mentioned. I, I do think that where we are in our lean journey, one of the tools in particular, target value delivery, is key to this concept, right? So we know things change over the course of a project, but you know, maybe material costs for a given piping system will just blow up at one point. But by building this aligned team that's committed to delivering to a target, but also committed to this culture of, okay, we had a mistake or we were hit by this surprise price adjustment, we're still committed to find a way to offset that cost. And we're all incentivized by hitting that target now our trade partners are encouraged to bring it to the table immediately for collective group think to solve that problem and still meet the conditions of satisfaction for that project. So we like to say that this process, this approach to projects is 80% culture, 20% tools. There's some cool things going on out there with the tools, but those tools don't mean anything if you don't have that buy-in and that alignment and approach to that model. But it, it allows us to steer and navigate through these hiccups on projects and still land at that target. Yeah. And I, you know, just to add, add to that, right. I mean, every, every job we have, when an owner kind of conceptualizes it in their mind, there's, there's parts of that facility that are value and will, you know, add to the value stream of that to getting product out the door. And then there's pieces that are maybe nice to have. And so when it comes to some of those issues, it's understanding where is value. And if, if something falls outside of value, can you negotiate, not negotiate, but can you give up something to still provide value to what is the facility, but offset some of those costs? I think another thing is just elevating issues really early to our clients and, and, and a lot like Greg mentioned, getting our trade partners to bring up issues early. If we can, we'd love to get our, you know, our estimators involved before an owner goes to the board of directors with a cost. What we, what we typically see is like an engineering director built a facility the same exact type three years ago. And they're like, I can build this for this amount of money. And they've just, they've, you know, it might be double the cost today with, with the market. So I think managing information as a team and then, and then being able to manage target value delivery is great. Yeah, it's it's all an expectation setting and, and the culture building thing is, is so key. I feel like you've been listening to earlier episodes of the show because I we, we talk about that a lot. It, you have to bring everybody along in the conversation. And and I don't mean that in a, your company's a democratic, everybody gets to vote on every decision you make, but it's it's more of a, an awareness and an informed conversation where you're, you're letting people know what the expectations are and that they have that safe space to, to bring problems to the table and and really meaningfully have that conversation. I've seen personally in the past when I was still working for GCs where there were situations where somebody's going, everything's fine. Yeah, no, we're on track. Everything's fine. And it hasn't been fine for six weeks, but they've been trying themselves to find a way to fix the problem. And then they didn't. 
and now they escalate it and it's an unfortunate situation and, and like i understand the the onus because they go i want to fix this i i'm owning this i i care about it but also there's so many smart people with so much experience in this industry and whether you're adopting an ipd type environment or not being able to leverage that experience i think goes a long way in, in just fixing those problems especially when there's so much uncertainty kind of tied up into the mix of the conversation it's it's huge like yeah. culture culture is the name of the game agreed so one of you mentioned, I can't remember which one of you earlier, prefabrication. And the last time that you and I caught up, you shared that there was some cool stuff that you're doing with prefab approaches specifically. And it's not a new topic for construction at large. Like I think people are talking about prefab for years and years and years, but in really narrow scopes of I'm going to prefab my casework or my cabinets or something, but the scope of what we can do in prefab is huge. And I, I love it. And I think it's awesome. Yeah. There's an episode earlier in the, uh, in the series actually that you should listen to if you are a, a prefab geek as I am, because there's a lot of really cool stuff shared, but I want to hear what CRB is doing. Like, give me the, give me the, the deep dive on what you've started to bring to the table for your customers. It sounds like it's really cool. Yeah. So obviously, you know, when you look at a plant, there's lots of, there's lots of opportunities to go do prefabrication and we actually have one project that's that's in our region right now that we're we're targeting 75 percent prefabrication 75 percent we'll see if we can hit that that's a, that is that's a pretty long that's goal, awesome that's, sorry to interrupt you but like that's <laughs> that's excellent yeah and so i i think you know it's not there are certain situations right if you have a stick built facility on the side of a hill probably not doing much prefab but if we have a flat lot there's certainly a lot of opportunities so you know, on the mechanical side of it, we have a lot of partners that we're working with to bring in early to get to get skidded utility systems, especially central utilities. On the pharma side, which is I think is something I'm I'm really excited about this. It's it's our new our, our new group, Slate Space, which if I don't read this exactly, I'll I'll get grief from the people. So I I for my people. So it's CRB solutions for multimodal manufacturing through modular integration and delivery. So the, the ATMP industry has really, you know, it's a lot of startup industries, uh, start, startup companies that need to be really nimble and they need to get to market really, really quick. I mentioned earlier in the podcast that life sciences is, is changing rapidly. And that's true. If you can't keep up, you you know, someone else will invent that product and you're out of the market. So this, we really developed this to be agile, adaptable, scalable, and resilient through design and construction. And so right now, and, and they may correct me on this after Katie can correct me after the fact, but they started with seven layouts for ATMP type facilities. And, and we've got all the design. It's think of it like Lego design. Everything's already designed for those seven different layouts. So an owner could come to us and they say, Hey, we have a, we're, we're going to be building a building and we, we know, you know, we're manufacturing ATMP products. And I like layouts one, three, five, seven. You know, what we're saying is we can get those, those modules prefabricated a lot quicker. And I think we're saying four months or I can get the exact stats. I think it's reduction in labor by 80% by doing this reduced schedule by 40%. And that's design and construction. It's commissioning and qualification. On the backside of it for the actual modules, we we partner with a bunch of different vendors. So one vendor might be able to create, you know, a hundred modules per year, but we may need a capacity of a thousand modules. So we have to partner across many, many vendors across different geographies to bring to bring in a very adaptable, quick way to prefab units, modules off site, and be able to de deliver them mainly to get life saving products to our customers much more rapidly. At the same point, they need to be able to change. So if that product fails, well, now they don't want a capital investment that doesn't flex with them. So it's pretty neat. We'll, we'll provide you a link for anyone interested who wants to learn more about it. But that's that's probably something I'm most excited about with our prefab journey. Yeah, no, it's it's really exciting to me as well. We're we're talking about basically prefabricating the heart and soul of you know a, a biotech manufacturing facility. And Mark mentioned ATMP a few times. That's advanced therapeutic medicinal products. So really on the bleeding edge of, of therapies right now, cell therapy, gene therapy, and and Mark mentioned it. But there's a lot of competition to get to market quickly and not everyone's going to succeed with every every attempt and recognizing that these are startups and want to maximize their initial investment these modules modules are developed to be very flexible you can switch campaigns switch different manufacturing technologies all within the same place but in a way that allows us to build and test 
and really ship nearly turnkey clean rooms offsite while we're making ready the space in which they'll eventually live. How has that impacted some of the, the permitting aspects of what you're doing? Because it, it feels like you, you're, you're in a position now where since there's consistency and you're pushing such volume, I'm, I'm assuming that within the, the realm of life sciences, it's a extensive both permitting and certification process when things are done. How does that change the conversation as far as speed to market? Yeah, I'd say it's a lot of, you know, sitting with our different jurisdictions and, and being, you know, typically they're concerned about fire ratings of, of different panels. And then a lot of inspectors are concerned about local tradesmen from their groups and unions installing the work. So it's, it's really about having that relationship early with the, the jurisdiction, potentially even sending them to the, the fab shop so they can walk it and go see, you know, if there's a boiler that's offsite, they can go, go look at that before it's installed. We're not going to get everyone to travel, but that's where, you know, we may may start to use some some teams meetings or some virtual, you know, walks of, of the site. So that would be my answer to that. Yeah, it, it sounds like a great approach. I mean, when you've got that kind of kit of parts focus and you're you're able to standardize to a degree, but still be flexible within the realm of the the scope of what your customers are doing, it's such a great moment. And the focus and the the scope and scale of what it feels like we're able to do with prefab today versus where we were five years ago or ten years ago, it's it's only getting better. And and from what I've learned too is you can also be very, you can create very beautiful facilities too. It's not this hideous box that nobody likes and is very uninspired to work in. Like there's a lot of flexibility and a lot of cool stuff. Like it's it's just better. Yeah, that's a that's a huge misconception we battle is is that they can't be. Oh, I can't, I can't move a wall in the future. No, you can. No, it's not going to look pretty. No, they're, they're some of the most pretty facilities now. Yeah. And you're doing it in that controlled environment too. So you get all the great yep. things tied to not just the, the speed, but the safety elements and the, the consistency. So there, there's a ton there. So for, for the prefab nerds out there, and I'm sure there's at least a couple of them, make sure you do go back and listen to that earlier episode because we dig in and it's, it's a really fun conversation. But also you alluded to something that I think is important and it's tied to one of those key points we just mentioned back into the, the relationships conversation and bringing in your, your trade partners to letting them the, see some of these things and touch them. So can you can you talk a little bit more specifically about your your owner relationships and how you've both helped them navigate the current market and the uncertainty, but also have have been able to educate them to understand the benefits of some of the things that you're proposing, hopefully earlier in the process to to kind of make that a little bit more comfortable. So this is a this is actually a fun one. Recent example here, Eric. We, we, were, we were fortunate enough to make a final round of selection process uh, for a CM project a few weeks back, and we were asked to present our team and approach. I'd characterize this client as traditional in their delivery model positioning, but opening slightly to learning about how they can enhance their, their lean journey. So unbeknownst to the client, we decided against a traditional presentation approach in favor of what's called a lean coffee. If you've never done that before, it's a very collaborative, engaging discussion to really get to the root of a common set of problems and then ultimately align on solutions. So we had a client project team likely thinking they'll spend the next two hours in a very passive manner as we stand up and, and present our typical slides they've probably seen you know 10 times before. But we were able to show them through the way we engaged in, the, in this interview what a true team approach could feel like. Now, I read the room as quite surprised at when we were doing so and maybe slightly uncomfortable at first, but it was awesome to see everyone kind of coalesce around this. And ultimately, that was a contributing factor to our board of that project. So, you know, it's, a, it's one thing to talk about it, but it's another to find ways to help your clients experience this new way of doing business. Yeah, I'd say, I mean, the collaborative aspects Greg mentioned and team health, right? Through, if you look at the stress of a life cycle of a project, it starts really jolly and then it gets more stressful, 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 and maybe just ends on a high stress level. So I think being able to manage the, the team health to your owner back, you know, they may be putting undue pressure on your team that's causing poor performance. And so their driver, whoever their PM or, or list of consultants may be, may be causing the wrong behaviors on your project. So we're, 
We're implementing a lot of team health surveys to try and mitigate that and educate and create awareness of how health is so important of a team. Certainly managing a risk registrar, right? From day one, what's going to bite us? And then when those things come to fruition, it's like, oh, well, we already said this was going to bite us. And here's how we said we should go deal with it. And that way we're not, we're, there's going to be certain panics of, of a job, right? But I think getting it, getting in a cadence of dealing with it health, in a healthy fashion is really important. I love everything you both just shared. Greg, I apologize. I might've looked like I was chuckling at the start of what you were sharing. And it was, it was a positive chuckle because I've been in those rooms and I, I know what you're sharing as far as the traditional expectation of we're all going to go around the room and give our, our slides that are slightly adapted from the last slides we gave you on a similar project. And there's a, there's a time and a place for that. But what you did to bring them into this is what it's going to look like if we do this. And you, and you kind of brought them into the uncomfortable moment, but in a really productive way. That's really cool. And I'm really happy to hear that it worked because I think that those are those moments where you get to grab your owner and you shake them a little and you go, hey, like, I know you've done it like this, but we've worked together before, or I can show you 10 other clients that I've worked with that also think this is awesome. Let me show you. So as a former AC proposal manager for many years. I, I, you, you give them the bullet points. They go, okay, you asked for this thing, thing, thing. We can do all that. That's cool. That's great. And then that's the, but wait, there's more. <laughs> and you jump in and you, you put the, the, the more on a pedestal. And if you get to do that in an innovative way, like it sounds like you did, that's when the lights come on. And that's when you start to change those processes and, and bring people into the conversation. So sorry for being so excited right now, but like, it's rare that I get to look back at my proposal hat and go, yes, like, yes, that's what we want to do. Because uh, I, I lived that grueling life for a long time as well. And sometimes you're not empowered to, to do it that way. So that's great. So to turn that in into the, the other direction, so we, we kind of talked about the owner's relationships, which I think have a different focus sometimes than the way you work with your specialty contractors, your trade uh, partners, and the GCs and everybody that you're, you're working with. Can you tell me a little bit more about how you've managed those relationships, both the model that you've put together and then also just some of the uncertainty there? I, I'd love to hear some of the, the wins you've had in, in bringing them along for these more progressive conversations conversations and approaches that your, your team adopts? So I think the first thing is, you, you know, you want to be setting any company you sign up for a job, you want to make sure they're going to be successful. And so we, we've, obviously we, we go through pre-qualifications and we, we look at a lot of details of their company to make sure they can take on the size of the job, their safety is in conformance with what we're wanting to do. But we do something called the trade partner assessment. So we've created quite a detailed analysis of each trade partner. And sometimes that's conducted you know, via solicitation or interviews, and we'll go through how, how do they, have they worked on a design of this size or have they, how many designers do they have on staff? Do they have VDC capabilities? What does your quality program look like? If you have a shop, what are your shop controls like? And, and, and just being able to understand everything about their project to make sure that we're aligned before we write you a contract. Because everyone's going to say, you want a $20 million project? Yes. Yeah, that sounds great. I'm <laughs> going to sign up for that. And then you get into it and they maybe didn't have the skill. It doesn't mean they're a bad subcontractor. It means maybe we didn't align correctly before we went went to, to work with them. Uh, once they're onboarded, we go through a chartering approach. So it's really, and that's with our client and everyone where we, we kind of align on the values. And that means what's your profit profitability? What, what are you going to make on this job? And, and yes, we expose some of those things and, and it's good to talk about it because I want our partners to make profits and be successful and grow their business because if they're growing, we're growing together, we're working on jobs together, and it's just, we're going to end up getting better. And now on the backside of it, we have an, we're starting to ramp up a, a subcontractor account management program. We've always had client account management programs. We're focusing on tailing our business to our owners, but we're doing that for our subcontractors now and trade partners. So we're really going to start diving in. How do we, how do we get better? Because Gosh, no, I, we have a lot to improve on as well, it, but also, hey, here's some feedback. How do we, you know, lean, the lean journey is all about continuous improvement. And you did ask for one example. So I, I, I had a um, drilled, drilled shaft sub, uh, trade partner that we brought on to a project very, very early. The owner was skeptical about it at first, but we had worked with this trade partner all over the country and our confidence was through the roof. And so we did, we did some analysis just to show them why we thought they were, you know, we did trade partner account assessment 
and and why they were the winner, why they thought we should be our partner, brought them on, and our design for drilled shafts, the cost was roughly $3 million for that package, and they were able to come up with an alternate design that met the same design criteria that that put it at like 1.5, literally cut half the cost. And so just bringing that that knowledge about drilled shafts, which is pretty, you know, it's a hard thing to master. If you bring the expert, they can bring some really good answers. And that's like one of my favorite examples I love to bring up. I, I like that. And it sounds like you're, you're hitting the ground very, very focused. And I think we've all seen this at some point in, in our careers in the construction industry of just pushing that risk down in, in a very aggressive way too, where it's not, let's grow together and build our relationship and then in turn work on the next project building on that. It's a, here, I'm going to yell at you for lack of a better phrase, as far as get that done. That's what you said you were going to do. And, and there's due diligence on everybody's part, I think, both in, in the, the CM and the GCs understanding and evaluating the, the subcontractors and not in a, in, a, in a crappy way, but in a very honest, are you the right fit for how our business does business? Because then we can build those relationships and come to the table in an honest way, instead of a, a misin, misalignment of expectations there. So you're, you're on point from my perspective. Not that my perspective necessarily matters, but I, I think it's 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 a great approach. Greg, sorry, I, I want to hear if you've got anything else to add into that one because the the relationships there are just just so dang important for the success of our businesses. Well they are and and, and Mark really hit on how maybe how we might select and join and form and, and you know initiate those relationships, but maybe taking it back to a portion of the estimating process that typically maybe siloed from trade partners and, and owners and, and again, traditional arrangements, a risk, a, a true risk analysis on an estimate, a Monte Carlo risk analysis session. Uh, I really enjoy that process myself facilitating those. And earlier in my career, before we kind of found this path, you know, it was all about, you know, protecting the CM, protecting our position on the project. But when we enter into these type of arrangements, it's really awesome to see our mechanical engineer in the room with our client's mechanical engineer at the table, with our mechanical subcontractor, with our internal mechanical estimator and everybody talking openly and honestly about the risks they see and seeing how that cumulatively adjusts and everyone on the team understanding how we're handling things like escalation, design development, construction phase contingency, all, all driven from that data-based process. And I think that goes a long way to continuing to develop and strengthen those key trade partner relationships as well. And there's so much to be said for for having the right people at that table early on. And it's it's something I've heard from mm. a lot of tradespeople that I've had the opportunity to speak to, both within the, the confines of you know what we're doing today and in just in my own personal experience, because outside of contracts and all the other traditional structure of our industry, those trades have so much knowledge to bring to the table that it's it's oftentimes a miss not to be able to get them to weigh in early because they can course correct a lot of stuff that is going to end up having to get captured in a change order later on or some scope element that is going to delay the project when you get down to that point and you go oh that that won't work or we could do this better and save time and money and also everybody's happier at the end of the day so in finding ways to empower those conversations as you're picking your partners and then just continuing those relationships it's huge it's it's one of my favorite things to to hear about when we're doing it well because it it empowers everybody to make better decisions and have all the information to to make those decisions so as I had mentioned earlier, I am a bit of a technology nerd. I can't help it. It's just uh, there's so many cool things going on in the uh, in the space of construction right now. And I know we've we focused more on some of the methods and the relationships tied to the uncertainty bubble that we've talked about here. What role has technology specifically played in in either changing or improving your approaches to product project delivery, and then also managing some of the uncertainty that we're seeing in in the last couple of years. So this is, I think it's a pretty cool example of, of something CRB's done and really had to do during the pandemic in order for projects to be successful. We specify process equipment for, you know, biotech, pharma, food and beverage, and it's prefabrication as well, but it, this is equipment designed for certain 
capabilities, capacities, et cetera. And it's often overseas, maybe Europe, maybe in different parts of the US, but one of our steps is to, to go through a factory acceptance test. Now you think back to maybe a project that was tagged a warp speed project where it was all about bringing these facilities up for vaccine manufacturing. Those schedules did not care that maybe people did not want to travel to check out that equipment in person. So our digital delivery team deployed the HoloLens as a method. We shipped them to the, to the factory where the equipment was built. And maybe we had someone local there, maybe not, but via the HoloLens, we were able to go through and perform a factory acceptance test virtually. Now we've started to build on that success through virtual punch list walks. We're playing with overlaying the current design model and visualizing it through that AR HoloLens in the field to allow us to better adjust and, and tailor our design, maybe without having to step foot in a facility because we couldn't. Maybe that client just wasn't allowing it at the time. And, and we, we really did work through those situations with with that technology. I'm over here aggressively nodding my head because it's your your all those technologies are are so valuable in this context that there's just so much cool stuff we can do. Mark, I I, I want to hear your take too. What uh, how how is tech wrapped up into this as far as changing uh, the the trajectory for your team? Yeah, I think you know if you if you talk about like our facilities are living and breathing after we're done with them. We don't you know we don't build warehouses that just the lights turn on and off. We build really complex facilities that need to operate and be safe. So for us, you know, eliminating uncertainty is getting our, our maintenance engineers in the model early and looking at valve placement and ergonomics and, and safety by design. So one thing we're looking really heavily at is how, how safe is this going to be to actually operate, right? Does a maintenance worker have to work you know, so you have to get up on a ladder to do something, or are we building in a platform? Or can we eliminate a platform and bring that work to the ground? And so I think that is eliminating some uncertainty to our, our owners and our end users and, and the maintenance folks. And I think VDC, you know, everyone says, well, we've been doing VDC for 20 years. I think today VDC is way different than it was 20 years ago. We're there's more automation built in. There's there's a lot of you know model libraries and things that we can automate and, and then clash detection. We're getting better at how quickly we can get all the spaghetti in the ceiling organized. And so that's that's pretty exciting to see how we're developing on that front. Yeah, there's there's so much room to, to grow here. And the theme that I always try to come back to within this scope is a lot of these technologies do sound like science fiction sometimes. Or they go, oh, this is, this is this future thing or whatever. But the reality is a lot of it is here and a lot of it isn't tied to replacing humans or changing the way that they're, they're able to do their jobs and eliminating jobs. It's much more about augmentation and scale. And then also taking those repetitive things and making them accessible in a way that doesn't take somebody 40 hours to go do the thing. You've got technology to, to manage that boost. But also, Greg, what you were sharing about the travel part, as we've proved those, those value adds for all those different pieces of technology, it comes back to finding ways to fill our, our struggles with, with labor right now, where if you're able to do pun Punchless remotely. You can have somebody who does punchless all over the country, but still is at you know their HQ in Chicago or something, or opens up opportunities to people in different regions that might not have had traditional access to these roles and these types of jobs. So there's so much that I can go into and and nerd out about because it's it's just a great moment in our industry where we've laid the foundation in digitizing processes and workflows and improving how we capture data. And then now layering on all of these other really cool things that felt like they were science fiction and now really feel like tangible things that are being used every day on projects. Like it's it's here, like we're, we're doing it and we're just getting better, it's, it's really cool. So I always like to close these conversations out with a look to the future. And as I've uh, just nerded out very aggressively, I, I'd like to give each of you an opportunity to, to do that a little Bit. Is there any specific technology that you're each of you are really excited about or you think is going to just drive a bunch of change for the industry that's either here now or you think is going to be here in the in the very near term? And Mark, I'd love it if you could kick us off on this one. Yeah. So I, I already I already talked about prefabrication and slate space. I think where we're antiquated as a very complex industry is automation. And I mean process controls automation. 
it takes it takes a, re- a lot of really smart people talking with skids and and different systems to be able to get valves to open and close. And I think there's just you know the way Tesla disrupted the car industry. I think someone has the ability to disrupt automation with you know smarter valves that talk. The way we lock out systems and keep people safe. The way we program, right? It, it takes very specialized programmers. I, I envision an iPad app that you could, you know, you could be programming on any PLC and they, you just need an iPad on every PLC that, that talks, right? Instead of all the other stuff we need. So that, that's something that I think is going to be industry changing. Robotic utilization, you know, you're seeing a lot of survey automation, earned value, brick laying. I've seen some 3D printing. I, I think we're we're a ways from 3D printing. Maybe we'll figure out a way to deal with some of the unique metals and and cleanliness things we have to deal deal with. And I'm I'm confident we'll get there at some point. Another thing is digital twins. So when we turn over a model in the past, it hasn't been, you know, it has it's not very useful to the the client. But what if that model? And I, I think the oil and gas industry is maybe farther ahead than than life sciences in this aspect. But what if the model contained all this middle data and, and the as built were actually accurate and being able to to do a 3D scan of the room with with Matterport, which is one of the technologies we use, and overlay that with the model and just be able to have a lot more rich data in our models and then be able to use that for benchmarking of future projects. And all of a sudden you can automate the way we design facilities and automate the way we build them. And so I think, I mean, I could nerd out here for a while and just keep going, but I think it's it's pretty exciting. Mark, I think you and I need to grab a cup of coffee one of these days and, and go down the rabbit yeah. hole because there's <laughs> there's so much there that I agree completely with. And then also for the for the would-be founders out there as far as technology, I, I think the, the last couple of minutes here are worth paying attention to to try to find the, the next area to disrupt within the realm of life science construction. So I, I appreciate your, your glimpse into an optimistic future, but it's very aligned against uh, things that I talk about on, on the regular. Greg, how about you? Is there anything that you're particularly excited about that you think is going to bring some big impacts for us? You know, I see some uh, integration really on, on the front end of projects through pre-con and, and out into the field through some interesting tools. Um, got a plug here, um, ACC Autodesk Construction Cloud, right? We see a lot of value in the unified platform between BIM 360 and Plan Grid, amongst all the other features that are that are being rolled out here. So we're actively trying to find the best use of that system. But maybe one a little bit further down the road, uh, 3D photo capture merging with modeling, I think is another powerful way to even build on what we were talking about with what we're able to do with the HoloLens now. So a lot lot of potential. I I agree. And I appreciate you slipping in the uh, the Autodesk Construction Cloud plug on my behalf. I, (laughs) I obviously agree with you on that sentiment, but we're really at a unique opportunity with what Autodesk is doing as far as very, very clearly taking and building this platform that truly moves data through from design to pre-con to construction to operations and maintenance and wraps back into what Mark was talking about with the digital twins, especially as we're starting to educate more owners in this in this space as far as what's possible. If you partner with your teams early enough and you, you build with this in mind, you get to turn that li- living, breathing model over. And then also there's an opportunity there for a lot of contractors and construction managers to continue that relationship with your owner to help them keep that model updated in a way that they might not have the resourcing to do. And so they will know what exactly is in their building for the rest of time instead of going, well, I think I know it's in that wall. Let me go grab my box of binders and flip through, you know, the, the as built that I think are the accurate ones. So it's a very different conversation. And we're not always quite there yet with the digital twin conversation, but I, I'm optimistic that it's, it's, it's on the horizon or already there for some of the more progressive owners of the world. I'm laughing at your comment because I can think of each plant we work at and who the guy is or gal i need to go ask you know what where's this utility at because (laughs) (laughs) it's it's a challenging thing you know and it's not an easy thing where you go oop i've I've picked up this thing and i'm gonna go do it now but with the right planning and and foresight and i think just education for everybody who's playing a role you're in a better position to get those things into a real trued up and meaningful system so it's it's all awesome i i'm as much of a nerd as all of you are apparently uh, as far as all these future technologies go but i do have one final question for each of you 
And it's one of my favorite ones because we get a, a choose your own adventure approach to construction technology. But Greg, I'm going to put you on the hot seat first. What is one tool you will always carry in your toolbox, no matter what type of project that you're working on? So this, let's go a little abstract here. Um, this is one that I've worked on. I continue to work on every day and tying it back to technology here. There's new technology at every turn, right? And it can be overwhelming pretty quickly to, to figure out which option to, to explore and leverage and how do I do it? How do I keep pace with my normal, you know, set of expectations? But it's kind of accepting the fact that technology is here really to iron out the wrinkles and bad processes. I think you mentioned something similar to this earlier. We still have to mind the fundamentals, but let's accept it and, and leverage the technology for those incremental, in some cases, much more than incremental efficiency gains. But I think you have to couple that, and this is back to more than just technology, bringing that continuous learning mindset every day. And it's an opportunity to learn something new and continue and grow. And I, I yeah, I, I, I think that's probably my best advice for what what tool to bring every day. I like it. And it's it's a, having that openness to understand where there's changes to be made or challenges or improvements is is really what it takes to be a successful leader, regardless of the industry that you serve, because you're, you're always out there listening and trying to find those ways to improve. And, and you're right on it as far as there's some noise in, in construction technology right now. There's a lot of stuff to, to consider and evaluate. And if you have that continuous improvement focus in are being intentional about how you're consuming construction technology, instead of chasing the shiny new toys for the sake of chasing the shiny new toys, you really do set your organization up to be successful in a way that you might not have been otherwise. And that's not to say you shouldn't be looking at, at the new and everything else, but as you pick your strategy, both with data and technology, you have to be focused. Otherwise you're gonna overwhelm your team at some point because they're not sure the why behind what you're doing. So you, your education conversation is, is huge there. I, I love it, Greg, that's that's a good one. Mark, how about you? What's, uh, what's your tool that you'll bring to every tool or project, no matter what you're working on? Yeah, so I'm getting coached by uh, a gentleman named Alan Crawford right now. He, he used to be our VP of construction for our Southeast region. And and he was, he, we were in one of our coaching sessions and he, he asked me, you know, Mark, who's the most important employee in the, in the company. And I, yeah. And, and, you know, I, I stood there thinking about it and I'm like, well, all my employees, and he goes, no, it's, it's the person you're talking to. And I think that resonates with me in a big way. And it really, it comes down to the relationships. We mentioned it probably a hundred times on today's podcast. So it's, it's really a people first approach. We've talked about 80% culture, 20% tools. I want CRV to be a great place to work, but I also want it to be a, a great company to work with on the owners and the trade partner side. If we could bring that to all of our projects, I think we're we're going to have more fun at work. We're gonna we're gonna deliver better quality projects that are that are you know more within schedule and cost. And so. I think it's all about the people. Yeah, there, there's a huge amount of value in having that emotional intelligence to step back and go, I'm focused on the conversation I'm having right now to truly deeply understand what's being shared with me and then using the knowledge you have to, to either bring them to the table to the right people or connect those dots. So that's that's a great answer. I, I I don't know how I would have answered it myself if I had been posed that question either, but the framing feels like the right one and does come back to the the bigger culture conversation that we're having today and just at large as we continue to improve our industry as a whole. So that's uh, also an excellent one. I, I like the take that you've both have uh, have kind of brought there. And as you both have alluded to over the course of today's conversation, you're working on some cool stuff. Like there's some really neat things going on right now. Is there anything that you'd like to plug or share with our listeners that you think that they should know about? Greg, how about you go first? So I'm, I'm working on some benchmarking activities from maybe some perspectives that, that are certainly new to, to us and I think to the industry as well, both backward looking and forward looking and really kind of what we talked about maybe with the ACC, how we tie this all together and create that continuous loop of project information and next project and and, and, and on and on. But uh, beyond that, we're, we're just really busy. We, we're growing. We have a lot of cool projects to, to look at. A lot of exciting work here at CRV. 
It's great. And the, the data focus is a good one for, for our regular listeners. They've heard me talk about the harnessing the data advantage in construction, which is a, a recent report that I had the, the privilege of working on with FMI that really does come into talking about those strategic decisions that you're making. And it sounds like that tracks back to a lot of, of what you're doing. And I had the privilege of presenting on that at a conference recently. Are you sure that you weren't in the, uh, in the audience somewhere in the back? And I just didn't see it because what you're, what you're sharing is, is very much in line with what Jay and I have talked about at length. And I think there's there's just so much there. So I appreciate you sharing that. Mark, how about you? Is there anything that you'd like to plug for our listeners today? Yeah, I think, you know, we, we didn't cover it, but but CRB does consulting, engineering, architecture, and construction. We have 1,800 employees across the U.S. and, and Europe, as well as uh, Toronto and Puerto Rico. And one solution we've talked about, Slate Space, we've talked about I'm really excited about the direction of our company, you know, really focused on life sciences and food and beverage. But I think, it, you know, if I had to boil down one thing I'm most excited about, I'd say it's 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 really the slight space and one solution elements. I think that if you talk to those groups, the innovation, it like boils out of these meetings. And so I think we know where we want to go faster than we can get there, but we have all the energy in the world to, to try and get there and, and bring our partners with us. Yeah, having that that enthusiasm in, in creating that environment to, to cultivate that, even if you don't necessarily feel like you're going to be there in a week, you get to build on that. There's there's a ton of momentum there. So it sounds like you're doing all the right stuff. And I appreciate you sharing the uh, the insights thus far with me today. I, I've learned a ton for sure. But if our listeners have any questions for you, and uh, I didn't pepper you with uh, enough during this conversation, how can they reach out and connect with you? Well, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Also visit our website at crbgroup.com. And you can search for myself or Mark there. Yeah, I'd say the same thing. LinkedIn, if you reach out, I'd be happy, you know, to, to talk to folks. I will plug this as well. We are hiring in, in every office and region. That, that, that list can be found on our website as well. So come work with us. All right. Well, it sounds like there's opportunity both to, uh, to learn more about what we've talked about today and also uh, some career opportunities as well. So, so take heed if, if you like what you're hearing. And I, I would be surprised if people don't because you're doing some really cool stuff. But at the end of the day, I just want to say thank you for joining me, both Greg and Mark. It's been an absolute pleasure learning more from you about what your organization is doing. And then everybody out there listening, thank you so much for joining us on Autodesk Digital Builder Podcast today. As always, if you have questions for me, or you have a guest in mind that you'd like to suggest, please don't hesitate to reach out. You can find me on LinkedIn. I'm the only Eric Thomas at Autodesk. I post a lot, so I'm not hard to find. I'm also on Twitter at builder underscore digital. And then I have to do this, but it does make a huge difference if you go out and rate our show on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Spotify just opened up a brand new feature to rate us. You bump us up the charts, make us uh, rank higher in the algorithms. I don't know how it works, but every, uh, every rating and comment does make it a little bit easier for people to find our show. So I would sincerely appreciate if you took the time to go out there and do that for us. And on that final note, goodbye. You've been listening to Digital Builder. To ensure that you never miss an episode, subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast player. If you're listening with Apple Podcasts, we'd love for you to give a quick rating of the show. Simply tap the number of stars you think the podcast deserves, and then you're done. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.